we're live. Thank you everyone for tuning in tonight on Tuesday evening. We're here for a live Facebook Zoom webinar with Jim Renacci and Joe Knopp in their run for Ohio governor to, to cover the failing education system in Ohio and answer any questions that everyone might have. I'll lead it right into our governor candidate, Jim Renacci. Well, thank you all for being on tonight. Gives you an opportunity to better get to know who Jim Renacci is and Joe Knopp um, and what our positions are, whether it's on education or some of the other positions, corruptions, so forth. Tonight, of course, we're going to talk about education and we're going to talk about the things that we would do as a team when it comes to education. Now, I can tell you that um, we already have a position paper out there. We've talked about it. We've uh, uh, said that we're going to absolutely put a, a director of education. We're going to put somebody in there who's going to, number one job is to oversee that our education system is working. When I say working, I'm talking about working for the parents and the child. I'm talking about making sure that CRT is not part of our education system. Common core needs to be eliminated. You know, some of the other issues, whether it's, you know, sex education, issues that are being brought into our school system um, or social emotional issues that teaching uh, uh, criteria that are brought in, being brought in. This is not in, needed in our education system. What we need to do is make sure that our children are ready for jobs, that they're ready to get out and, and uh, understand reading, uh, arithmetic, writing, but they also understand history, our history, American history, History that will teach them, that, yes, there were bad things that occur in our past, and that's what we learn from, but there are also good things, and we should learn from both, the bad and the good. We should understand why America is so great, and we need to make sure that our history um, is propped up into our education system. I'm going to continue to talk to people around the state who want and believe in those ideas. We've already talked to some that will be appointed to the school boards and that will be put in a, a position of overseeing our education system. And all of those individuals will have to have that criteria and that background, which is that we want an education system that teaches the basics. We don't want to be controlled by the federal government. And we want to make sure we're teaching the right quality education and eliminating all of these other social, emotional, sex education, and, and also um, you know, uh, the CRT programs as well. So our goal is gonna to be to step up, make those changes. And then somebody might ask, well, how do you enforce them? Here's what I would say. As a governor, first you have to lead. You have to say, no, I am not going to allow or approve these type of education issues in Ohio schools. You can put out uh, some executive orders. Now I can tell you, executive orders can get overturned by the law, but at least, you're showing your position. And then you gotta work with the House and the Senate and say no more. I'm gonna to work to defund any of these schools that continue down this path. And that's the thing that, Joe, those are the things that Joe and I are gonna be doing to make sure our education system is the best in the country, but also one that prepares our children and grandchildren to be able to graduate and get a job without going to college or graduate and, and go to uh, higher education, or how about this one? And we're gonna promote this as well. Graduate from high school and go into the military too. Another great opportunity, three opportunities. You know, the gross come straight out of K through 12 and get a good paying job, uh, but you gotta be prepared for it. We wanna have that uh, vocational educational training in high school. We also want to train them if they do want to go to school to, to higher education. And we also want to train individuals and prepare them if they want a, a career in the military as well, which is also a great uh, career path as well. So I don't know, Joe, if you want to add some things as well. Yeah, so thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Education is obviously uh, really important to Jim and I, but Jim did a great job of presenting our platform 
and our uh, passion to uh, to to fix and uh, and how we plan to fix the education system here in Ohio. I just want to speak for a few minutes, uh, just you know, uh, emotionally as a parent. You know, my kids, as many of you know by now, are 17, 14, and 12, so just in the heart of education. And as I uh, talk to my uh, uh, friends uh, who also have kids in the system and travel around the state like Jim and I have been doing for quite some time now. You know, there is this fear uh, with, you know, CRT uh, is, uh, is the bold printed uh, uh, title that most people are talking about, but there's additional fears for what is happening to our schools and how do we protect parents from being involved in their kids' education. And I think for, for a quick second, it's really important for us to understand, and this is what I really appreciate about Jim when he looks at a, a problem, is peel back all of the layers. Um, when we look at CRT and where that began, it was decades ago where the left very strategically uh, pointed out that education and entertainment is the way to get to our kids. And they had been very diligent and strategic in slowly working into the curriculum um, in, in Ohio and around this country. And it's, it's, it's a battle that we understand and that I promise you that we will fight it to the end. Um, like Jim was saying earlier, you know, the history of this country, uh, there, there were some dark spots, but there's a lot of positive that has occurred in this country. You know, I spent a lot of time uh, in my early years in Philadelphia. My kids have been to Independence Hall. They know uh, who really did establish this country and what their intentions were. And that is the history that we need to present. Um, so as a parent with kids who are uh, still in the school system in Ohio, um, when I look around, it is parents that are stepping up right now, just like they did in Virginia, to guarantee that they have a say and that we continue to have a say in our kids' education. So I promise that Jim and I will continue to do that and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you all out in the road and talking more about it. Awesome. So let's jump right into the Q&A segment of this. And uh, we'll start off with a question for Jim. Uh, Jim, under your education overhaul, will you see funding for troubled kids who need to take advantage of credit recovery schools or programs? Well, look, I will tell you that we need to make sure that the funding that's necessary gives every child, no matter where they live in Ohio, the opportunity for the best education possible that they can get out of Ohio. And, and I think we need to look at all of these things um, in, in, a, in a, you can't look at any th one thing in a vacuum. You have to look at all the things in education and all the issues and come up with a plan that makes sure that ultimately at the end, every child has the best education possible. So the answer is yes, we'll look at all of these things. Many of these things, uh, there are already educators who know how to fix this, how to change it. Those are the people I'm going to gather around in our administration to say, help me make sure all of this happens. Look, I've said this all along. I've been a successful businessman for 38 years, not because I was always the smartest guy. It was because I brought good people around me. It's one of my plans. It's one of the things I'm going to do when it comes to education is I'm going to bring people around me who can help me change our education system so it is the best and give all children the opportunity um, to come out of Ohio from K through 12 with the best education possible and to be able to compete with any other kid in any other state. That has to be our goal. Absolutely, and, and we have a question here for, for Joe. Um, Joe, you have school-aged kids. How has the current education system affected your children? Well, when I look, when you ask that question, I actually uh, think back to the past couple of years. I know we're all still dealing with COVID for some reason, um, and I, the, with uh, DeWine and Houston, uh, the biggest frustration that I have and the you know anger that I have is that when my kids missed a year of school, and I mentioned this before, you know, academically it's hard for you know my wife and I to uh, to pick up the slack to uh, help the kids get educated when they're staying at home, but the the social impact that is last forever uh, in these kids when they miss out being around their friends when they miss out interacting with their peers both the good and the bad um, that 
is what has really, uh, really, really even sparked kind of my passion to uh, be as involved and to join Jim in this race is because I need to make sure my kids are equipped uh, for their future. And again, academically, it's one thing, but the rest of the aspect, as we look around this country today, and we see the negative results all on the news every single day that kids who are not um, equipped to work together well with others. So what has shaped my uh, desire for uh, part of our education plans today is we need to make sure we have the best academic uh, opportunities for our kids. But at the same time, we need to make sure all kids in all areas of our state also have the ability to socialize properly with, with each other so that when they leave high school, they graduate high school, they continue to know how to work well together. Yeah, you know what, I, I just wanna add something really quick because Joe hit uh, the nail on the head in a few of those areas. The New York Times, for any of the people watching, New York Times wrote an article about two weeks ago. And remember, a liberal paper wrote an article of the damage that has occurred to our children with lockdowns, masks, shutdowns, uh, not being able to, to go to school, having to be forced with, to, to wear masks. If you read that article, it's scary what we've done to our children. And in fact, Joe and I have called this. This is child abuse. We are abusing our children for political reasons, instead of letting them have the education they need. And to go along with that real quick, I know it's a passion of ours. Why are we looking out for these adult teachers who know how to protect themselves at the, at the cost of our kids and their ability to learn how to socialize with one another? It's just not fair to them. Absolutely, and, and we have a question uh, also on, on Facebook that just got asked, and it's thoughts on consolidating small local school districts to save money. Well, look, I've been talking about that all along. We, there's four major pillars of spending in the state. A lot of people aren't aware of that. Education's one, Medicaid's another one, roads and bridges, uh, and then prisons. Those are your four main spending areas. We have an $80 billion budget today, which by the way, needs to be cut. But $80 billion is spent primarily, primarily in those four areas. Now there's a whole bunch of overhead as well. But one of the reasons why we're spending so much in uh, education is of the overhead. Now I know people don't wanna hear this, but it's so true. If you look at the statistics, Ohio will have the least amount of, of 18 year olds in 2034. That's not too far off. That's 12 years from now. Yet, we still have the same amount of school districts, the same amount of superintendents, the same amount of principals. In many cases, we have not looked to the future and said, wait a minute, we've got a number of schools, small schools, that could at least share services. When you think about sharing services, maybe share a principal, maybe share a superintendent, maybe share an auditor or administrative staff share some of this stuff so that we can reduce our expenditures. And then quite frankly, and I've heard this as I've traveled the state, one major high school is only two miles away from another major high school. Wait a minute, who was thinking about that? Why would you have two major high schools in two different districts, you know, a couple miles apart? Again, we need to be better and smarter and spend the money wisely at the same time, we need to make sure that the kids are getting the education they need. So yes, we need to look at all of that. I'm going to be the type of governor that actually pulls out the checkbook every once in a while and says, why are we spending this? And why are we doing that? And I'm gonna be challenging our state house and our state Senate and saying, look guys, we need to get this budget down. We need to compare it to what people are spending in other states. Uh, so yes, we're going to be looking at all that. And, and by the way, I think taxpayers want that. They want people to say, wait a minute, why are we spending this? Why, why do we still have six or 700 school districts when our population of 18 year olds is going down? Somebody should answer that. I'm going to force that to be answered. And we're going to, then we're going to look at how we can cut overhead as well. Awesome. And, and we have a question for both uh, Jim Renacy and Joe Knopp here, and it says, um, it's from Connor Royce, 
and he wants to know what specific actions that you both would take in his administration to stop the schools from promoting CRT and you know switching bathroom genders and all, all of those issues. How would you enforce schools to actually enforce those? Well, look, I said that earlier. Um, Joe's gonna be an important member of this team. Um, we're gonna be out and about. We're not gonna be sitting in the castle in Columbus. We're both gonna be out and about talking and communicating, not with donors, which I know the current administration does, but with actual people, voters, parents, this is what's important. And the real thing is we're gonna say, look, school district, if you decide to continue to push CRT, then we're going to look at ways of cutting your funding. I'm gonna write executive orders to say, anybody who, uh, who pushes CRT and some of the other issues that people are really upset with, um, I'm gonna write an executive order to say we will defund uh, those school districts. Now, I will also tell you that many times executive orders are, you know, can be deemed as unconstitutional. I want to send the message. I'm going to send the message. Leadership is about leading. Leadership is about saying we're not going to do this. The best example is Governor DeSantis. He said the same thing. He put out executive orders saying he was going to be defunding many of the programs, uh, the school programs that push CRT and other things. That was overruled by the courts. I get it. But at least he's sending a message. That's what we need to do. Joe and I will be sending messages that we're going to stop the overreach of some of these unfunded requirements from the federal government. And we're gonna get our kids back to a point where they get taught reading, writing, arithmetic, and history. Joe, I don't know if you wanna add anything. I was gonna say, you mentioned uh, DeSantis, but we can also look at Virginia right now. And ultimately we have to protect our kids also in their environment. So when it comes to you know different bathroom issues and stuff, we need to make sure our kids are safe. And, and when they're not safe, we definitely have to hold these schools accountable and provide the, the safest environment for our most uh, precious uh, citizens of the state of Ohio. And then again, when it comes to CRT, you know, we will do everything we can from Columbus to make sure it's not infiltrating our schools. But at the same time, you know, and part of my responsibility would definitely um, be having my, my ears with the people of Ohio and make sure we understand what is being taught to kids. But at the same time, as we're learning in America today, not just Ohio, you know, we have a much greater responsibility than I think uh, we, we understood at some points to understand what our kids are being taught. You know, I think the curtain kind of got removed a couple of years ago when we were watching our kids uh, be taught through uh, these computers at home. And we learned that uh, we, 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 we might have let a little bit of, a, uh, of it slide. We have to step up. And we live in a time today where, and my wife could, she's upstairs listening to us right now, but she will testify that, you know, mothers in this state are more protective than ever before of what their kids are being taught. And I've, um, I've spent a lot of time with mothers over the past couple of weeks, and I guarantee they're going to hold Jim and I both responsible to make sure their kids are in a safe environment and they're learning appropriately. By the way, I would, I would add one other thing too, you know, because when you talk about uh, transgenders, I can tell you that we need to be able to lead and say, Biological men should only be able to compete in men's sports and biological women should only be able to compete in women's sports. It's another part of our education system that is failing us. And we have Governor DeWine saying that we should leave it up to the authorities, the sports authorities, that's garbage. That's garbage. We should be saying right up front, we do not believe in biological men in the high school competing with biological women and at the same time, biological women competing with biological men. Although that doesn't happen as often, it's still, you should be a bio, if you're a biological man, you support and met you, you actually are only should be competing in men's sports. If you're a biological women, the same thing. That should also be the same thing for our colleges as well. Governors have to lead. Governors have to make tough decisions. Governors have to say things that sometimes make people mad but that's okay because governors have to represent the majority of Ohioans. Absolutely. And we have a question from Ryan Anderson here for Joe. 
And he was, he was commenting on one of Joe's earlier comments and he said that you were dead on about the leftists taking over our culture and education. And he thinks that you might have a unique perspective based on your involvement in the movie Unplanned. So if you wanna comment on that a little bit. Yeah, so thanks for uh, saying that and, uh, and uh, noting that, you know, with Unplanned and, and really uh, my passion for doing that story was simply uh, it, it needed to be told the country needed to understand what, you know, abortion really is. Uh, obviously, Jim and I are uh, extremely uh, pro-life uh, uh, group. Um, but what I have learned with my uh, time in Hollywood is the left owns Hollywood. And very strategically, have they uh, gone to the arts to take that over? And somehow I do believe uh, the conservative party uh, kind of let that one slide. But if you think about it, all of us that are watching this Facebook Live right now, we're doing it on a device. A lot of our devices that are on phones can even fit in our pockets. So we have the ability to consume entertainment um, no matter where we are in the, in, in the country today. And our kids, you know, depending on what age we allow our kids to use devices, you know, earlier and earlier, it seems like they all had the ability to consume entertainment and the left knew that would be the case. So they are messaging every single day what their agenda is. Um, so my desire as a filmmaker and as a storyteller is to, you know, we have better stories on our side, uh, us conservatives. We are the ones that bring morals and values to the table. So we have to step up and we have to tell our stories. That's why when I did the, the, the movie Unplanned, uh, we had to show the country, show the world what abortion really is. When I did the story with uh, President Trump and his family, we had to step up and tell the real stories about our president, the story that the media, not only won't they tell, they will tell nothing but lies about. Um, so part of what you know, I'm looking forward to bringing to the table is you know, a story can do uh, a great way of getting our message across. And I think we can have some fun with that to make sure Ohioans truly understand where we stand. Hey, Joe, I, 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 I got to throw this in too, because I was laughing while you were talking. And, and I was just thinking about somebody who made the comment, I don't know, I think it was yesterday or the day before, that we got a used car salesman and a movie <laughs> actor running for governor and lieutenant governor. And that is the furthest from the truth um, as you talk about it. You actually helped produce the story. You were not the actor. And I have to always chuckle because I had 60 different businesses. One of them was a car dealership and I never sold any cars either, but it just shows you um, many times how people are so misinformed when they say, you know, uh, a used car salesman and a, a movie actor. Joe's a business guy who has actually produced movies um, as well. So uh, that's, it's a great point the way you explain that. Well, the other funny thing is, I got to believe most people uh, watching this right now, they drive a car and they watch movies. So that's yes, okay. That's, that's absolutely true. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and Zabby Russo has, has a good question here about an issue I know that's on a lot of our minds. And it's how will you address the medical discrimination as it relates to education? And would you encourage safe spaces and school that protect protect medical freedom of kids who don't wear masks or vaccinate? Well, look, I'll start with this. And I know Joe's got a lot of concerns with it as well. Um, I've said all along, if you mask a child for eight hours, that's child abuse. And it is. Most of these kids see the difference between gov a governor, Renee and a lieutenant governor Knopp and a governor, DeWine, lieutenant governor Eustace, is that a governor, Renee and lieutenant governor Knopp are talking to the parents and they're talking to the teachers. So when I talk to the teachers and they tell me these masks, the kids come in and they're, they're dirty, they're filthy, they're wiping their nose in the inside of the mask, the masks are hanging off, half the time they don't keep them on. And yet we got a governor who's saying, you better keep those masks on for eight hours. Um, and he's saying the superintendents and you better make sure these kids keep their mask on. They're not even wearing them properly. It's child abuse. So I can tell you, a governor Renee and Lieutenant Governor Knopp will continue to talk to the parents, continue to talk to the teachers, and continue to realize that you can't force these kids. By the way, when I talk to high school teachers, you know what they tell me? Kids come in with the mask, they take the mask off. They don't enforce it. Those kids are sitting at desk and it's a joke. You know why? Because 
it's not, a, look, it's just not medical freedom. These kids need to be able to grow and they need to be able to mature and they shouldn't be set, sitting around with masks on, on their face. So I think the best way of doing that is leading and saying, as I said earlier, you school districts are not going to push this. This is between the parent, the child, and their medical doctor. Now I'm going to throw a real curveball in here. If the parent and their medical doctor believe that the children, that child should wear a mask, let them wear a mask. That's their right. But there's no government official that should make them all wear masks. That's the key here. It's about choice. It's not about mandates. It's the same on the vaccination. If the healthcare professional that they trust believes their child should be vaccinated, let them get vaccinated. But if they don't believe that, and the parent doesn't believe that, no school should be forcing this. No government should be forcing this. We got to protect those freedoms. And I'll just add to that, that uh, I protect the parent. I, uh, I, I trust the parents to make the right decision with their kids. Um, and especially, no offense to us dads out there, but I know my my wife and uh, and a lot of her friends, friends, they spent a lot of time talking about these issues, researching these issues, and talking to the pediatricians. And our job with Jim and I, as we help lead, part of leadership is information, and we will continue uh, to to build uh, an ability to communicate what is happening, to have uh, access to a database with information, so that parents can make intelligent decisions. But at the end of the day. I don't trust government to make decisions based on my kids. I trust my wife far more than I trust uh, DeWine or Houston to make those decisions. So Jim and I will continue to trust parents. And we, when they ask us that they need additional information or additional help to make those decisions, we will do our best to provide it. But at the end of the day, I think we'll let parents do the parenting. Great points. And uh, we have a question here from Paul Indre, and he wants to know, what do you both think about Glenn Youngkin's approach right out of the gate in Virginia? Well, I would tell you, uh, uh, Governor Youngkin's approach is Jim Renacci's approach. We're going to come right out of the gate and put those protections right out there. We're going to have a statement. We already have that. We've already put our statement of fact where we believe we're going to stand. And we're going to continue to push those things so that day one, day one, we can come right out and say, we promised and now we're following through with our promises. I can guarantee the voters that on day one, we will be doing exactly what the governor did in Virginia as soon as he took over. We're gonna be doing the, many of the exact same things. By the way, that's leadership. That's what we're lacking right now. That's what this current governor does not have. He sits back. He listens to everybody. He doesn't lead. He's afraid to get out in front of anything. You know what? Great leaders, great leaders have always gotten out of, of front of the issues and at the same time allowed many cases their constituents to help them make the decisions. You got to listen to your parents for schools. You got to listen to your constituents. You don't listen to big donors like, like this current governor does. You listen to the voters and you do what's best, uh, but you get out and lead. We have a governor today that just does not get out and lead. Yeah, what I love about watching uh, Youngkin in Virginia is he was almost like uh, like that racehorse just waiting to get out of the gate. He fully executed everything that he said he would on day one because he has been traveling that state of Virginia and was so in touch with uh, the parents and the citizens of Virginia. What Jim and I are going to do, you know, we are uh, in touch with the people of Ohio because even, uh, you know, not only having business here, but working here, um, our passion is actually the people of Ohio. Sometimes I think the wine Houston, when they mention Ohio, it's like this land. They forget that there's actually people here. And the other thing about DeWine, you know, I think the last time he actually spent time with the voters was 45 years ago when he first got elected into office. A lot has changed. You know, for example, I was born and, uh, you know, I'm 47 years old. So uh, I've uh, a lot has changed in the past 45 years. Um, and in order to be a good leader, just like we saw with uh, uh, President Trump, you have to continue to get right uh, to the people to communicate that you are serving. And uh, that's what I, when I spent time with President Trump, I kept hearing the fact that 
when he ran these companies, uh, he skipped middle management when he went to visit and he went directly to the, the waitress, directly to the hostess to find out how are we doing as a company? And Jim and I are going to do that same model and we're going to make sure we're serving the people and we're asking them to hold us accountable. And that's the great thing about uh, uh, being voted into office. Hold us accountable. And if we don't do what we say we're going to do, it's pretty easy to get us out. By the way, I have, to, I have to laugh again, Joe's comments. I mean, think about this for the Facebook watchers and listeners of this. Um, DeWine was an elected official when Joe was three years old and I was a freshman in high school. Now, think about that. This is how long this guy has been around. And what has he done for Ohio? Ohio actually has gone from one of the top 10 states in the country to one of the to the bottom 10 states in the country in all kinds of areas, all kinds of areas. And he's been around for 45 years, a part of that. He should never be allowed. Look, all his, his entire life, he wanted to be governor. He got it. God bless him. Now it's time for him to go home. Now it's time for him to let people who are really concerned about the people, the parents, the constituents, and the voters. But also, and I got to tell you what I'm more scared about than anything, we got to make sure we get a hold and, and of what's going on from the federal government side. And we got to be a state that's strong enough to say no more to the federal government. Have you ever heard Mike DeWine say, we are not going to do that with the, what the federal government's pushing us to do? I promise you, a Renee CNOP team will be saying that more and more. I want the federal government to be suing us for not complying with them. That's going to be the key. We, we're going to make our state one of the best states in the country. But in doing that, we got to make sure we challenge the overreach of the federal government. Absolutely. Great, great points there. And we have a, a good question here from WT Ever. And they would like to know, how would you define a well-qualified candidate that you would appoint onto the Ohio Board of Education? Well, look, I've said that already. Um, when we get closer and, and uh, after we're elected, we're going to have uh, a team of people help us. Um, it's kind of like how I picked my lieutenant governor. I brought a team of, you know, 10 or 12 people in. Their sole purpose was to help me select a lieutenant governor who was going to meet the qualifications that we needed. Um, we went, we started for, at 40 people to 20 people to 10 people to five people to two people and then Joe was selected. This is what we're going to do. We're going to do this with our director of education. I laugh. One of the, one of the I think it was the Cleveland Plain Dealer said, oh, Jim Renacci is going to appoint somebody to be the director of education. There's not even a position. Well, guess what? Governor DeWine appointed his lieutenant governor to be director of innovation. Lots that's done in the last couple of years. What has the director of innovation done? Governor DeWine can appoint a director of innovation who was never, ever part of this, you know, the cabinet. And, and yet the, uh, the fake media uh, has, has said that, well, Jim Renacci is talking about a position that's not there. Well, guess what? We're also going to eliminate that um, director of innovation, uh, not only in the voting booth, but also that position. We're going to get back to running the government lean, but also putting people in who are going to oversee the policies and procedures that we want to get done. And, and that education director will be somebody who has educational background, will understand what it takes to uh, help us maneuver through the swamp, but also at the same time, we'll be standing up for the principles that we believe in. Awesome. And we have a, a good question here from Jonathan, and he's asking, Students who attend Ohio public colleges that return to remote learning, um, should they be eligible for any sort of refunds? Well, you know what's interesting about that? Uh, um, and I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna answer it that maybe Joe's heard some things too. I've had a lot of college students, uh, parents call me and say, you know what? I paid for the dining hall. I paid for the room and board and I'm not getting my refund back. Listen. Um, I hate to say this, uh, but a Governor Renacci and a Lieutenant Governor Knopp are going to make sure 
that if you paid for something and then the education system is pushing you back in the home, you should get a refund for that. You should not have to pay for a meal plan when you're not in school because they've take it, pushed you out of school. You should get a credit. If you had a dorm room that you, in, in some cases, some colleges say you have to be on campus as a freshman or whatever. And if you're required to do something and then they require you to go back home, the answer is they got to give you a refund. Uh, Joe, do you want to, have you heard any of this? You want to uh, chime in? Yeah, I think uh, the, the frustration that I hear from parents who have kids at college right now is it's almost some of these uh, universities have gotten out of touch with uh, the amount of money that they get uh, per student. And, and, and I know as I have a 17 year old looking uh, to go to colleges in about a year and a half, it costs a lot of money at, at all levels of colleges. And uh, the idea that uh, these parents are actually not getting what they're even paying for for the students. And again, you know, just like I said earlier about uh, K through 12, uh, you know, the academics is a part of it. But as we all of us know who have been on college campuses, uh, there's a lot to be said for being with others and having uh, that social experience and being in a classroom and having actual debates with other students, having actual debates uh, with the professors. You, you can't replicate that on a Zoom call. We, you, you just can't do that. So our kids are, or these kids are missing out. And then there's an actual, you know, you know, uh, you know calculatable uh, financial uh, amount that these kids are paying for when it comes to, uh, you know, um, uh, just, you know, whether it's uh, meal plans and stuff like that, that it's really easy to calculate what they're missing, that we need to get back to these kids. It's, you know, we still, uh, kids come out of college with record amounts of debts. A lot of these kids have debts the size of mortgages today. And to not be getting the education that they're paying for, it's, it's, it's a crime. Absolutely. And we have a, a question from Sarah Cleveland. And she's not very happy with the public schools. And she wants to know what your thoughts are about school choice. Well, I can tell you, this is an easy one. I've, I've been saying it for years. Um, and actually, it brings competition. I love competition. That's what our entire country is made of, is, is competition. If you can put competition in the education system. So I'm 100% believer in, in choice. I believe that we should come up. In fact, I've already talked about this plan many, many times. We should come up with what we believe is the best cost of educating every single child in, um, in the state of Ohio. And then every child should have that amount of money. Let's assume it's $10,000. And, and it could be 12. It could be eight. I don't know what that number is, but whatever it is, let's assume it's 10,000. That parent should be able to take that 10,000 and go anywhere they want uh, to make sure their child gets the best education. Now, Here's another interesting twist that I've been talking about for years. If the, if the parents in a certain school district believe they want to do more for their children, then that school district can come together with their parent, that parents, and they can make another decision and say, look, 10,000 isn't as much as we want more. And if they want to vote their own levy, they're, they're making their own decision to make it 12,000. That's their decision. Again, it's their choice. But we have to make sure that the government gives everybody the same opportunity. It's one of the four pillars of the, what the federal, what the state government's supposed to do, education, K through 12, and university education as well. But we got to make sure that every individual has the same opportunity and can take that money and go to a Catholic school, a charter school, um, or their public school. They could stay in their public school uh, again. It's about giving the parent the choice to take that money. Now, I know there's a bill out there right now called the backpack pill. I do support something like that, where you can take that and move it from place to place to place. By the way, um, we also have something in high school where there are career tech education, should be able to use some of that money. If you decide you want a career tech uh, position, you should be able to take some of that money and go to career tech too. Another thing, that uh, the Renacy NAP uh, team will continue to push for. It's all about the best education for the child, but giving the parents and the child the opportunity to make that choice. 
And I'll just add to that, uh, Jim said everything. But, you know, as a kid that grew up, uh, you know, in an orphanage, like most of you know, I am very sensitive that all kids get equal opportunity uh, to succeed in the state of Ohio. And we have to keep a, a microscope on all of these kids and make sure they are getting the opportunity. So yes, when the money actually follows the kids to have a choice of what school these kids go to, that gives a percentage of these kids that don't have the opportunity today, a greater opportunity to succeed. And um, Renacy Knopp, our desire for the state of Ohio is to, it, it starts with the kids because they are the future of Ohio. And we have to make sure that all of them have an opportunity to take care of us when we're not in a position to, because they are the future leaders of this state. And I wanna make sure they're ready for that. By the way, um, adding on to that too, think about this. If you got a school district where all the parents choose to not go to the public school, that tells you something about the public school. Public school has to be able to compete with the choices that are out there. Now, I know there are some school unions who will get mad at that statement, but the truth of it is they should fight for those education dollars as well, and they should make sure the public education is just as strong as the non-public education and that we have competition in our educational programs. Absolutely, and uh, Brian Davis, um, somewhat along those lines, commented and he said that uh, college is not the end-all be-all for everyone. And he says there should be more focus on trade schools and what your thoughts are on, on offering more opportunities for those people. That's such an easy one. I've been saying this for years. I was saying this before Governor DeWine and, and, and uh, uh, Usted were talking about it. I've said that we should know what our educational needs are in the state and that we should provide an education base that makes sure that the jobs of Ohio are filled. So in the end, if 60% of the job openings in the state of Ohio are trades, we should make sure that 60% of the students coming out of high school um, understand the opportunities in trades. We should also be doing something that I think is really important. There are so many programs, and I see this in so many, so many businesses are struggling, struggling to get employees. But what I've seen is a good partnership. I saw this uh, up in the Cleveland area with a number of businesses that they go to the, to the high school and they say, and they, and they make sure they meet with the kids who have a, uh, a career day. And they say, if you're a welder, for instance, you can make $70,000 a year if you get to this certificate. And by the way, if you, if you come work with us after three o'clock every day, five days a week, we'll start you in that program so when you graduate from high school, you will have the certificate, and I'm just using welding. It could be plumbing, it could be other things. But in this case, it was welders. You will have the certificate that allows you to become a welder and make that $70,000 a year. Isn't that unbelievable? We don't teach that. We don't talk about that. You know, it's amazing. I know as I travel the state, there are, there are welders um, right here in Northeast Ohio they can make $200,000 a year if they have the right certificate, yet there are college educated and degreed people who can barely make 50,000 a year in the position they're in. Maybe it's time, and I'm not saying that higher education and, and college is a bad thing, it's just not the all and everything for everyone. I think we gotta get back to that. I'm gonna relate to one other story, which I thought is so disheartening when I, when I heard this, I, I've been traveling the state for, for many years, not just this last few months. And I remember at one point in time, I was going into these drug rehab centers um, before COVID. And one of the things I heard, an individual who was about 21 years old, he, told, he sat down with me and he said, um, you know, in high school, I was told that if I couldn't go to college, I was a loser. I was told if I didn't get through college, I was not going to be worth anything. I mean, it actually brought tears to my eyes the way he said it. He said to me, um, I, I went to my guidance counselor and he kept saying, you got to get college. I didn't, he kept saying, I don't want trigonometry. I didn't want to do algebra. I wanted to go and learn to do something with my hands. When I realized that I was being pushed into this situation, I finally decided that the easiest thing for me was to push away from that situation. 
And what I did, I started hanging around with the wrong people. I got hooked on drugs. I become, became a drug addict. I graduated, um, didn't finish all my credits uh, in, as a senior, so I didn't graduate. I ended up getting out there. Drugs became my priority. I got married. I mean, think about this. I got married. He said, then my wife, drugs became a priority to her because it was a priority to me. And then we had a child. Now think about all this and where it started. It started in high school. And it started because we didn't give that individual the opportunity to say, you know what? There's another option other than college. And if you want to work with your hands, let's get you to that place. And that's why I told you earlier, maybe you want to work with your hands but you also don't wanna be a plumber or electrician or some of the other things, maybe you wanna to go to the military. And that's another option. We gotta give our kids all of those options and say, here's what your opportunities are. Yeah, I'll just add to that real quick because I have a 17 year old who is uh, halfway through his junior year. So I'm watching him and a lot of his friends, uh, you know, try to map out their future. I mean, do you remember what it's like to be 17 years old? I kind of forgot until I'm watching my uh, current uh, boy go through it. Uh, it is hard to know what you want to do for the rest of your life. And I think the, the pressure that schools have put on, uh, you know, both probably more so even pressure put on parents to make sure your kids go to college. Look, we have a lot of great colleges uh, in Ohio, and they're going to do just fine financially if um, if a if a few kids choose to go into the needed areas of uh, of all these trades that are out there. I had to uh, um, have a plumber come to my house the other day. Do you know how hard it is to get trades to come to your house today? They are in such demand, you can't get them to come. And uh, the cool thing about it was this this uh, you know I call him a kid guy came to the house. And uh, he has his own company, basically, and he is thriving. And he has actually now taken some classes, I think he mentioned online, to learn some, uh, uh, some, some business skills to go along with, uh, he didn't realize he was going to be an entrepreneur, but he is building his own plumbing practice. And there is such a need uh, for his service right now that he, he is excited. So it was really fun to, uh, to kind of watch this kid uh, just kind of thrive with the skills that he has now. You know, it's interesting, as Joe said that, um, I was sitting there thinking, I do remember what it was like uh, <laughs> leaving, try, trying to figure out what I was gonna do when I left high school. And I also do remember, and for those of you that don't know my story, I mean, we, I didn't have anything. My parents didn't have any money, um, but my mom was begging me to go to college. And I still remember saying, mom, my dad didn't really care. He wanted me, to, my dad was one who taught me how to put on roofs, uh, work on cars, I mean, he always said to me, I'm going to make sure you have a skill set so that you always will have a job growing up. So when I was growing up, I fixed cars, I did body work, I put roofs on houses, I worked with contractors. He always knew that I would have something to fall onto. My mother, on the other hand, used to say to me, you got to try college, you got to go to college. And I'd say, Mom, I don't want to go to college, because how am I going to pay for it? And that was another problem. But you know what, I went because my mom asked me to. I worked three jobs to get through college, but I will also tell you college ended up being the right thing for me. Now, I will also laugh and tell you, if you need a roof put on, I still know how to do it. I still know how to work on my car. I still know how to do body work. I still know how to do the basics of all those trades because during my high school years, I worked at a body shop. I put roofs on. If you think about those, those are all good fallback opportunities. I still can wrench a car. I can do all those things because you know what, those are the basic things I had to learn before I went to college as well. Absolutely, and we have a, uh, another question here from Sarah Cleveland, and she asked regarding life, um, and this is to both of you, uh, would you support equal protection laws for unborn babies? Well, I'll start out first. Look, there's nobody that has, nobody in this election again, that has a voting record. Now, a lot of people say when you have a voting record, you're a bad person. I just got off the phone earlier with somebody who was saying, anybody who's ever been elected before is a bad person. Well, look, that's, that's, that's not a good thing to say because we have a lot of good elected people. We have the Jim Jordans of the world. We have you know, uh, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. We have people who stand up who've been elected. We have uh, Senator Rand Paul. All of these individuals who are elected people who stand for principles. 
So they also have a track record. Well, my track record, I was elected. Um, and by the way, um, I didn't go to Washington because I wanted to be elected. I went to Washington and it's, it's a time for another story because something was taken away from me from the government and that was my car dealership. That's what prompted me into saying, I got to get into Washington and start fighting. But the good thing about being there is I saw the swamp in action and I also had a voting record. And I can tell you that I have a 100% record. I believe based on my Catholic background and my Catholic faith, that life begins at conception and ends at natural death. I will fight for that. That is a basic right. We have to protect the unborn and I'll do whatever I can as governor to make sure. And by the way, I would never ever appoint a medical director who is a Democrat, number one, but number two, also pro-abortion. That right there should end Dwyane's career forever, forever. He appointed a pro-abortion medical director. So again, my record is clean. I'm going to fight for that. But the difference is leaders lead. You're going to see Joe and I coming out and saying, we believe in this, House and Senate, get us a bill. We believe in this, House and Senate, get a bill on my desk. I don't have to, I'm going to let Joe explain himself, but Joe's got a powerful story and a powerful movie that says how important life is to him as well, Joe. So go ahead. Yeah. So first of all, this is a passion of mine. I'll try to say it, uh, quicker than 90 minutes, which how long it usually takes me to tell this type of story in a movie format. But, um, you know, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for individuals uh, who went out of their way to, uh, to to step out and help my two sisters and I get off the streets of Philadelphia, get into an orphanage, and so many people along the way that volunteered their time and services uh, to, to provide for me. Uh, Jim and I, that is a passion of ours. We are going to continue to do that at, at the beginning of life, which is conception. You know, when we set out to do the movie Unplanned, believe it or not, there's a lot of easier movies to market and get people to go see on a Friday night at a movie theater. But I will tell you is um, we knew that God told us to make that movie because we needed to really provide a tool for all of these folks on the on the front lines of the pro-life movement to demonstrate what abortion really is. And uh, one of the ironies that occurred with our movie was um, Hollywood elitists who represent the rating system, the MPAA, uh, they gave us an R rating. So when we got the email for the reason for giving us the R rating, uh, because if you think about it, a lot of Marvel and superhero movies, they only get PG-13. Why were we worse than that? Hollywood told us it's because the violence against humanity that occurred on the screen. So violence against humanity when they saw two abortion scenes on the screen. So that says it all. Even they uh, agree, they just don't know it, that life begins at conception. And Jim and I will continue to be on the front lines of fighting for life. By the way, just to add to that, I mean, one of the reasons Joe is my lieutenant governor is because when, we, when I really started to narrow things down, one of his strongest assets was his pro-life um, asset. When you put a guy like Joe with somebody like me who has a record of fighting for life, you have a life team. And I promise you, right out of the gate, we will be a team that is pro-life uh, from conception to natural death. Absolutely. And here is the, uh, the final question of the evening as we're, we're closing out here. And it's from Laura Lee. And she wants to know how both of you will help us homeschoolers retain our rights and prevent government overreach into how we choose to educate our children. Sure. Well, uh, Laura, thank you for that question, too. And I've said all along, homeschooling is an important aspect of education as well. So I'm going to make sure that we have a director who understands the rights and what homeschoolers want and listens and understands and provides for that right now. Homeschoolers don't get the same um, over, don't get the same opportunities, or, or what I should say, from a director or from the government that they should. Homeschooling is a right. It's also a good option for many children, um, and it's especially an option for parents. So we need to make sure we have the people in place who understand that homeschooling should be an option and make it as powerful of an option as the, all the other options, whether it's public school, whether it's private school whether it's homeschooling, we need to make sure that we have people in place 
And like I said, I will make sure that the director understands that. Nobody will be our director unless they understand that all of these aspects, and that's why I put it in writing. I mean, it's out there. So after I'm elected, you could pull, um, you know, what, what Joe and I have said is, is our priorities. And you could say, well, wait a minute. It says here that homeschooling is, was a priority in, the, in, in, your, um, in your education reform overhaul. It will be. And I think it needs to be an important part. We have to make sure that every child has the best option available in conjunction with their parents so that they can get the best education and prepare, be prepared, as Joe said, to take care of Joe and I and you uh, and, and many others in this state um, as they grow and prosper. But here's what I would hope every child has in this state. And I mean this from my heart. You know, I came to Ohio with nothing, nothing. But I understood and my parents told me, by the way, I was telling somebody, I'm on the phone a lot, you can imagine. Today I was telling somebody that my parents didn't have much, but there was, in, my, in our town, didn't have much. But of course there was a wealthy person in our town. And I still remember the day my mom and dad used to say, you see that wealthy person over there? He said, she, my mom really said this, my dad too. You know, if you do the right things, work hard, get a good education, understand the principles and values, you could be like that person too, if that's what you want. And it's all up to you in this great country. This is what Ohio gave me. This is the opportunities I wanna give your children and grandchildren to also live the American dream. That's the most important thing. We need to make sure you as a parent, give your children all the tools, just like my mom and dad, and the tools aren't always money. The tools are sometimes just the love and the opportunity and, and the education uh, to be able to understand that anything's possible in this great state, in this great country, if you do the right things, work hard um, and get the right education, which may include uh, homeschooling as well. Uh, Joe, do you wanna add anything? Yeah, I'll say, uh, you know, just like Jim and I have been saying earlier, you know, what we understand is parents know best. So for some family environment, for some uh, uh, kids, that's gonna be charter schools. For some, it's gonna be a Catholic school. For some, it's gonna be public school. For some, it's gonna be homeschooling. I trust parents to make the right decision. And I also trust parents, you know, I have a lot of uh, friends and family who do homeschool. And uh, the question that I've gotten uh, a few times is, um, are we gonna be able to protect homeschoolers ability to still have almost like a hybrid environment where they can still take some classes at public school or, or still take some classes at a, at a private school and the answer is yes that is our our plan that is our uh, desire to have a structure where again parents are in charge so if they want a hybrid type approach for their homeschooling which i know many of them uh, uh choose a, a route like that then yes let's make sure that's uh, an, an opportunity they continue to have because at the end of the day Parents know how their kids are going to learn best, both academically and socially. And I will continue with, along with Jim, to trust the parents for how they're going to uh, raise their kids. Awesome. And that's uh, the final question. So, Jim, do you want to go ahead and close us out for the night? Sure. Well, again, I want to thank all of you for being on here tonight. Look, your time is valuable, and I appreciate and thank you for spending the time with Joe and I. At the same time, I hope you got to know a little better about my background, my experience, and Joe's background and his experience. I hope you got to understand when it comes to education, it's going to be a priority. It's going to be one of our, by the way, it should be a priority. It's one of the four major pillars of state spending. So it should be a priority. And we're going to make sure that the priority really exists with the parents. The parents are the ones that should be making the decisions for their children. You're going to have a choice in this primary election of making a decision between a couple candidates. I hope you really look at the differences because I truly believe if you look at Mike DeWine and, jo and John Euston, what they've done, I'm hoping you're saying, we don't want a future like that. And then if you look at Renee C. and Knopp, you say, here are two people who are conservative, two people who believe in giving the education back to their parents, two people who want what's best, individual rights, individual freedoms, and yet two people who have a business background and experience to get it done. I'm hoping as we continue to get out and talk to people, you all get a better understanding that your best choice going forward is the Renee C. Knopp team 
because of our background, because of our experience, but also because of our willingness to fight for you. So thank you for being on here tonight. Uh, and uh, we appreciate it. We'll have more forums in the future. Please join in and get to know the Renee Sinop team.